responded? We got a reply from Air Canada, which was just babble gaff. A new entrance to the Avalon Mall, a dangerous intersection, is being overhauled. We hope to go to tender on this project within the next two months. New fee, is it an offensive term or a term of endearment? I don't think it should be used uh, in any context. Well, in the weather department, we've got more showers on the go for tomorrow. Temperatures stay somewhat mild for some, a little cooler for others, especially Labrador, where there's some snow in the mix. The details are coming up. Well, it's a vacation gone wrong because of a major airline snafu. And as CBC Investigates reports, it involves a couple from this province trying to return home from a relaxing holiday in Portugal. Yes, here and now, uh, Jen White has been speaking with uh, the couple about their travel woes, and she joins us now live. So, Jen, what happened? Well, Randall and Claudia uh, Earl, they were, when they went to go board their flight to St. John's, they were told that their tickets were suspended by Air Canada, and their only way to get back home to Newfoundland was to buy. Just a few feet away, Polina Road, and it's almost impossible to take a left to head towards the mall. Trying to turn left on there is outrageous, and you should never ever try it because it's dangerous, very, very dangerous. As you know, there's been so many accidents there. Bud Davidge walks the congested section of Kenmount Road frequently and has seen his share of accidents since he bought a house in the neighborhood 27 years ago. They're always, usually always, turning on a left turn. Uh, there's been other things that have happened there too, like that pole got knocked down there a while back, 
and then there's been some serious accidents there, as you know. The dangerous intersection was in the spotlight in 2013 when a drunk driver pulled off Polina into the path of a motorcycle, killing Nick Coates. The driver of the pickup, Ronald Thistle, admitted to drinking the night before and the morning of the 11.30 a.m. crash. This area has been on the radar at City Hall for some time, and after years of delays, there's finally a fix. Now the plan on the books is to move the Kenmount Road entrance to the mall a few feet further east and align it with Polina Road, right across from where the Tom Woodford car dealership used to be. We assume and hope that the underground pipe work won't be too complex, uh, but otherwise, when you're talking curb and gutter and asphalt, th that could be done fairly quickly, and we hope that can be done uh, certainly in time for November. The owners of the Avalon Mall say that they're anxious to get this job done too. They say once the entrance to the mall is moved in line with Polina Road, the overall traffic flow on Kenmount Road will be much better for mall users and road users. Cease here, CBC News, St. John's. It's that time of year, the snow goes and the garbage appears. And nowhere is it more obvious than on the Outer Ring Road heading to Robin Hood Bay. Coffee cups, cardboard, and even mattresses. But are there plans to clean it up? Here now's Martin Jones has our story. Well, you name it and it's out here and there's lots of it. There's coffee cups, I see old windshield washers. There's even uh, old tires behind us. It's been collecting here since about 2015. That's the last time the province did a formal cleanup here on the Outer Ring Road. When they did it back then, they collected 110 tons of garbage. That's the equivalent of about 45 mid-size SUVs. So when is the next cleanup? Well, that was the question on Danny Breen's mind last night in city council meetings. He asked the city to draft a letter to the province asking for another formal cleanup. Mayor O'Keefe believed that decision had already been made and the answer was no. So here's what the province told us earlier today in an email. Al Hawkins, the Minister of Transport and Work, says while his department has done formal cleanups in the past, year to year it's left to summer maintenance programs. So how has it gotten this bad? Well, litter bugs are partly to blame, but it's also about the flying debris coming off the backs of trucks and vehicles when they drive past. It's not only a litter issue, but it's also a safety issue as well. So much so that the RNC have decided to crack down on it. Last weekend, they issued more than 50 tickets to drivers with unsecured loads. So without a government formal plan to clean the highways, garbage is going to continue to build up until those summer maintenance programs begin. Reporting for Here and Now, I'm Martin Jones. Now late this afternoon, the province issued a statement saying it appreciates the concerns raised by the city and looks forward to meeting with them soon. Residents of Happy Valley Goose Bay and Mud Lake are watching water levels anxiously today. Ice break up on the Churchill River has the water rising, making many homeowners and businesses uneasy. And on the other side of the Churchill in Mud Lake, water is now seeping into some homes. Here now's Jacob Barker is live now with the details. So Jacob, what can you tell us? Well, yeah, I can tell you that within the past few hours, uh, the town of Happy Valley Goose Bay tweeting that the road, uh, the Mud Lake Road has been shut down. And at this time of year, residents of Mud Lake actually take a chopper from uh, down that road over the river to get home. But uh, because of conditions along that road, they were told to come to higher ground to get their chopper to get home. Earlier in the day, we got a look further down the road in one spot, water flowing across. Some of the road had been eaten away. Not too far away, one business owner has water and ice knocking on his back door. Today is the water rising like that. I tried to put a berm in place to hopefully hold back the water, but it doesn't look like it's working right now. He's brought in seven loads of sand to protect the lower area of his property. Set back a ways is a storage shed and a gas tank. Well, this is only the second year for me owning it, and. The family on her side had it for a couple years before, but they said this is the first time in years it's got this high. People from town are coming to this spot to see just how close it's come. They're concerned it may even come closer. We are so surprised because it was not like this last year. We are a bit far away from it. We are a bit far away, but uh, we are higher a little bit. We feel all right, but uh, we are concerned with others. The ice was moving at some points along the river slowly today, but it's jammed up at the mouth to Lake Melville. That's what's causing levels to rise. 
Along the Trans-Labrador Highway, ice and debris may have come further if not for the barriers. So right now it's, it's floating. Um, the water has risen higher than the deck board, so it is floating. At Birch Island, another flooded road and a fairly new boardwalk has come out of its moorings. We, we know the water is going to rise. We didn't expect it to rise this high. So, uh, yeah, a lot of people uh, watching closely the Churchill River as to what's going to happen next. But what the river does is a very unpredictable thing. So uh, a lot of anxiety, especially in the lower valley here in uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay. Reporting live for Here and Now in Happy Valley Goose Bay, I'm Jacob Barker. A court case involving the small capsule inside a Kinder Surprise egg revealed a startling figure today. 80% of the inmates at the penitentiary in St. John's are already addicted to drugs when they enter the prison. That was the testimony of Moni of the province's superintendent of prisons at a sentencing hearing in Supreme Court. Here now is Glenn Payette reports. Shannon Butcher has been convicted of trafficking in drugs. Three years ago, she smuggled cocaine, Dilaudid, and marijuana into the penitentiary inside a Kinder Surprise capsule. She was caught on surveillance video passing it to her boyfriend, Stephen Rumsey. Trafficking drugs in prison carries a mandatory minimum sentence of two years. But Butcher's lawyer, Michael Ralph, says that would be cruel and unusual punishment given the amount of the drugs and the fact that this was not a sophisticated operation. He says it would be a violation of Butcher's charter rights despite the mandatory sentence and wants her to serve just two to four months. But Crown Prosecutor Neil Smith says two years is fair because of the impact drugs have inside a prison. To make his point, Smith put the province's superintendent of prisons, Owen Brophy, on the stand. Brophy said that 78 to 80 percent of inmates at the penitentiary come in as addicts and that inmates will take any pill they can get their hands on, they will. Brophy told the court that drugs can have three times more value in prison than on the street. Brophy explained that when it's learned that an inmate has drugs, other inmates will turn on him if he doesn't share. And he said if an inmate buys drugs and doesn't pay, he's going to get assaulted. Brophy said drugs promote violence and put inmates and guards at risk. Smith says that's why trafficking drugs in prison is considered an aggravating factor in sentencing. This is the first time the two-year mandatory minimum sentence has been challenged. Justice Alphonsus Fowler will give his decision June 20th. Glenn Payette, CBC News, St. John's. Jim Parsons launched his campaign to be the next mayor of Cornerbrook today. Parsons chairs the Downtown Business Association and owns a theater in the city. He announced his campaign in front of a large crowd of business owners, friends and two current city councillors. His platform is based on supporting growth in the aging city while promoting culture and tourism. Parsons also promises a transparent city hall if he's elected in September. It has to do with, uh, with attitude and uh, leadership really from the top. So I think we need to um, really sort of instill the idea that, okay, we're working for the people and the businesses in the city. Uh, we're not just filling out forms. Uh, we're not just uh, uh, doing it because we're told to do it. We have to think about our greater purpose. Yep, the auctioneer had plenty to talk about today. Dozens of excavators, tractors, and dump trucks that were used on the Muskrat Falls project were sold to the highest bidder at an auction in St. John's this morning. The gear belonged to several companies that constructed access roads for the Muskrat Falls project. Now, for some bargain hunters there today, it was an opportunity to enhance a fleet of construction equipment. Uh, being in the construction business, you take advantage of every auction to see if there's any deals, uh, purchase new equipment, have a look at get new ideas, and uh, you know, always looking to upgrade your fleet and for a, a bargain. Canada's temporary foreign worker program has caught the eye of the Auditor General. After the break, we'll go to Ottawa for details from reporter Julie Van Dusen. 
It's the question that can spark a laugh or lead to fisticuffs. Is the word newbie offensive? Tonight, a researcher at McMaster University tackles the weighty subject. This weather update is brought to you by the Take Charge Business Efficiency Program. Over 400 businesses have saved energy and taken charge of their bottom line. Find out how you can too. pretty nice day today. Nice for some, not so much for others, but yeah. I know the folks in CBS really have reason to kind of rub it in today. Absolutely. <laughs> They're always bragging yeah. in Conception Bay South that they have much better weather than I've we do. I've noticed right that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> God's country, they like to call it. Uh, and you know what? On days like this, hands down, better <laughs> weather than town. Have a look at the differences uh, between onshore winds at the Narrows. Fort Amherst only hit seven. Yet CBS, Conception Harbor, Bay Roberts, uh, all the way around the horseshoe there. And you can see 18 to 20 degrees and sunshine, whereas the onshore winds were bringing the, the clouds for a good chunk of the day and the fog as well. And uh, Mount Pearl up towards the, the center city of St. John's was kind of riding that line for much of the afternoon, though the clouds did clear and allow for a little bit of heating uh, for the latter stages of the afternoon. But yeah, with a southeast wind and or a northeast wind or an east wind, no doubt CBS has, uh, has the better uh, uh, weather than uh, us folks here in town. Now, as we work across 
the island. 14 the high in Gander today. Cornerbrook just at 7. You'll see uh, why we're uh, staying cool and wet there. Happy about the Goose Bay at 10 degrees for a high today and Labrador City topped out at 8. As we take a look at your current temperatures, we are still hanging on to those mild temps for most of us. Labrador City has cooled off to 5. There are those southeast winds. Winds are pretty light along parts of the west coast around the center of this low, which is really raining itself out over western parts of Newfoundland right now and that'll continue over the next few hours and Labrador again into that rain this afternoon and that continues tonight as well another five to ten millimeters for Happy Valley Goose Bay Upper Lake Melville and so we're watching that uh, flooding concern there along the Churchill obviously uh, keeping a very close eye on that there are those steady periods of rain that have been working up through the Cornerbrook region over Grossmorn right now wouldn't rule out a rumble of thunder in here as well lots of convection with this system and it will work to the north tonight and note the wet snow mixing in. Happy Valley Goose Bay, McCovic and Nain will see flurries through the day tomorrow. Goose Bay will see a bit of a mix into the afternoon uh, as uh, the flurries taper to a bit of a wet flurry mixed with shower activity. And across the island, the showers scattered in nature and that's going to be the name of the game uh, pretty much through the day on Wednesday with a bit of a break for us coming on Thursday and we'll talk about that in your long range forecast. There's that messy mix from Nain down through St. Anthony for tomorrow morning. Bit of freezing rain possible. The rain mixed with snow. Temperatures around the freezing mark. We'll start with showers across most of the island. Wouldn't be surprised if we see some breaks of sun even from the start of the day tomorrow from St. John's up through Conception Bay North. Better chance of some scattered shower activity, I think, pushing in into the afternoon for the metro region. Note with the southwest winds, just six degrees in the onshore winds. I think we're eight to ten out of those onshore winds, even a little bit warmer possible. And should see a break of sun or two over the Buren as well. Again, on the east side of the Buren, away from those onshore winds. Looking at sun potential for Terra Nova, possibly Gander, but I think the cloud cover dominates for the most part. Bay of Exploits down through Grand Falls, Windsor, Harbor, Breton. Note the cool west-northwest winds with some uh, high elevation snow potential tomorrow from Cornerbrook up through Grossmorn, just 6 and 7 degrees. Clouds dominating here, and again, the best chance of showers on the island will be there along the west coast and also across the northern peninsula where we'll have the chance of seeing some flurries mixing in winds from the north. There are those flurries that continue tomorrow along the north coast of Labrador. Happy Valley Goose Bay with a mix even into the afternoon. Churchill Falls, a morning flurry, then clearing double digits in Lab City. We'll talk about your long range and your weekend, whether you want to hear it or not, coming up. Debbie? Thanks, Ryan, very much. Well, Canada's Auditor General delivered his spring report today, and he took aim at the country's temporary foreign worker program. Julie Van Dusen is a senior reporter in our Parliamentary Bureau in Ottawa. She joins me now. So, Julie, what did Michael Ferguson have to say? Well, he basically said this is a program that has gone through changes, but it has a lot of ways that it can improve. Now, just to remind our viewers, the Temporary Foreign Worker Program is a program that you're only supposed to rely on when you can't find locals, you can't find Canadians to do the job. Uh, now, the numbers have gone down. He pointed out that um, the government approved 163,000 temporary workers in 2013, and in 2015, it had gone down to 90,000 because they were tightening up the program. But he said there are glaring examples of where it's really being abused. And, he's, and he spoke specifically about the fish processing industry. He gave examples, uh, not necessarily saying where, but that uh, hundreds of employees may be let go in a fish plant and uh, go on EI. And next thing you know, the employer has hired temporary foreign workers. So take a listen to Michael Ferguson, followed by Dave Christofferson of the NDP. He looked at the case of 500 different uh, fish plant workers who had been laid off and during the time period that they were collecting their unemployment, um, there were 400 temporary foreign workers uh, hired in that same time period. They'd been laid off from the very job that they had and while they were laid off, they brought in temporary foreign workers. If ever there was an abuse in the minds of Canadians, that's a horror story, this is it. So, Julie, has the government responded? Well, Ferguson says this kind of thing has to stop. Now, the government says that Ferguson was relying a lot on data from the Harper government from, say, 2013 to 2015, and that since they've become uh, come in power, they're trying to make changes and making sure that Canadians get first crack 
at the jobs. Uh, now, the thing is, Ferguson really wants them to do more kind of surprise inspections, go into plants, see how many temporary foreign workers there are, talk to the employer, talk to the workers, and make sure that they really gave Canadians, local Canadians, a good chance. Um, and so the government says, you know, the thing is, it's all about not taking the employer at their word. Go in there and see what's going on. The government says it's willing to follow all of Ferguson's recommendations. So we'll see what happens. Julie, thanks very much for joining us this evening. You're welcome. We want our clear rules that everybody knows about and that are not only fair, but they're also clear and they're timely. Ottawa is moving forward on the plan to give people more rights when their travel is disrupted. After the break, the Newfoundlander who was at the forefront of the push for a passenger bill of rights tells us what he thinks of the plan. Welcome back. Transport Minister Mark Garneau introduced legislation today that he says will clarify and strengthen the rights of air travelers. The legislation deals with delays, overbookings, lost luggage, and seating parents traveling with children. Ron Charles reports. 
Nothing became clear today. What Ottawa is proposing for Canadian Air passengers is not a Bill of Rights. The legislation Transport Minister Mark Garneau introduced today calls it an air passenger rights regime, and it's short on details. Airlines would have to provide clear information in simple, understandable language to all travellers. There would be minimum compensation standards with regards to overbooking and lost or damaged baggage. It would also specify the airline's obligations to passengers during tarmac delays longer than three hours. But specifics such as what obligations, how much compensation and what constitutes clear language are to be worked out later. That will be the job of the five-member Canadian Transportation Agency, a quasi-judicial tribunal that normally rules on serious passenger complaints. And that worries some passenger advocates. Minister Garneau is entrusting a biased body which has shown its incapability and inability to enforce rights with designing and enforcing our rights. It is an absurd. It is a mockery of the rule of law. Passengers clearly want better, more consistent treatment. The plane is delayed. It is not my fault. I have paid my full ticket. You're paying for your airline ticket, right? So you should get some services. One right the proposed legislation does clearly specify guarantees parents seats in close proximity to children under the age of 14 without extra charges. Ron Charles, CBC News, Toronto. So those are the changes that are proposed to make up the Passenger Bill of Rights. With me now is a Newfoundlander who was at the forefront of improving air travel for people. Woodrow French is the former mayor of Conception Bay South. He's currently traveling and uh, I've reached him in Mississauga. So Woodrow French, you are in the middle of your trip. I'm just wondering how are the airlines treating you so far? Um, so far, so good on this trip. I haven't got, uh, haven't got uh, anything to complain of. Uh, a couple of about a month ago, I was coming back from uh, from a, a brief visit down south, and I had to wait two hours in the airport, and I got a ten dollar meal uh, voucher in uh, Tampa Airport, which probably could get me a bottle of wine. So I'm really interested, not a bottle of wine, a glass, even that. <laughs> but I just want to see what they're going to come and propose in the new legislation with regard to, to delays. Well, those proposed changes, uh, legislators are getting a first look at them today. Transport Minister Mark Garneau says airlines will be governed by new rules when flights are delayed or overbooked, and to quote him, so passengers are treated like people. How hopeful are you these changes will do that? Well, I'm hoping that the minister is uh, certainly going to uh, take the, uh, the lessons learned from the incident regarding the um, United flight and ensure that uh, there's no way in Canada that we can be treated uh, the way that the passengers were treated uh, on that particular flight. You know, the proof is going to be in the pudding, as they say, and uh, we certainly want to see what it is that they're going to propose and, and what level they're going to be held accountable to. And uh, certainly I won't be totally pleased unless it comes out as being equal to or better than the European uh, Airline Passengers Bill of Rights, which is probably the gold standard. Well, on, on that point, the other countries that you've looked at their legislation, um, what is it that makes that the gold standard? Well, the, uh, for one thing, it's the, they, they specify times and they specify amounts uh, that have to be paid to passengers as a result of their uh, not getting from point A to point B or not being treated properly, such as being put on a, a tarmac for... Um, for four or five hours because the airline doesn't want to move the aircraft back to the gate. So um, that plus, uh, it's got to have substantial teeth in it um, that's going to be meaningful. And I look at, uh, well, how are we going to raise our concerns and, and what's going to happen? You know, do we go to the airline? Is the airline being given um, uh, much wiggle room with regard to what they can do? And, um, and things like that that are certainly pointed out in the uh, in the European uh, Airline Passengers Bill of Rights. That's the type of thing that I'll be looking for and um, and certainly um, seeing if they can uh, and how uh, airlines are going to be held accountable for that. I would hope that um, 
that now uh, the minister is going to be serious about this, and once and for all, it's been you know it's going to be put into bed. The fact that the airlines have such a tremendous lobby in Ottawa shouldn't be an influence in this uh, particular case. British Airways are still flying, Air France is still flying, Lufthansa is still flying, and uh, Air Canada and uh, WestJet put themselves up into that league, and uh, they haven't been adversely affected by the legislation. And now they're going to be hopefully held accountable to provide a, um, a level of service that they, a standard that they should be uh, willing to meet to ensure that airline passengers have the best flight that they can possibly have. Woodrow French, we're going to leave it there. I'm sure you're going to be following, following this right to the end. Uh, appreciate your time, and uh, thanks again. Thanks, Debbie, and uh, like I said, I'm, I'm certainly going to have a good look at this, and, uh, and hopefully we can have a chat soon, sooner rather than later to, and say that it's a good thing. Thank you. Well, it's a word that either makes people from this province smile or it boils their blood. We're going to hear from a sociologist who researched the term newfie coming up. a question for all the Newfoundlanders and Labradorians out there. How do you feel when you hear the word Newfie? Does it make you feel proud? Is it a term of endearment? Or is the word Newfie offensive, dripping with a history of ethnic insult? McMaster University researcher Jamie Baker has been looking closely at both sides of the fence. And yes, he is a Newfoundlander, originally from Carboneer, and he joins us now from Hamilton, Ontario. So Mr. Baker, Newfie is such a polarizing word. Many people, myself included, cringe when we hear it. So what about you? Where do you stand on the word? Well, my perspective is that I don't think it should be used uh, in any context because of the social, political, and historical uh, association with the term. Um, it was one that was, was supposedly created by outsiders to refer to Newfoundlanders in a pejorative manner. Uh, so I kind of feel uh, it should be really stricken from uh, from our uh, our vocabulary. Now there are, will be those who will vehemently disagree with me, and mm -hmm. and indeed some of the research that I've conducted uh, indicates that for some of the youth uh, that I interviewed, 
they felt that um, it was a term of endearment, while others felt that it could be used as a uh, as a slur, while others felt that it was context dependent. Hmm. Well, before we get into your research, I'm just curious, what has your experience been with the word? Have you ever had a bad experience with the word Nufi? Have you seen it yourself being used in a derogatory way? Yes, well, actually, when I was in um, Ottawa doing uh, my undergrad uh, for part of my Bachelor of Commerce degree, um, I had an argument or had a discussion with a uh, an ardent Quebec nationalist uh, who was from, I think, uh, the northern Quebec, uh, northern Quebec, and we were talking about Churchill Falls. Mm -hmm. Obviously, an interesting discussion between Quebecers and Newfoundlanders. <laughs> Always. And, uh, <laughs> and you know, as the the argument was getting uh, much more in depth, um, he you know switched into French and then some, said something along the lines of, "I, I couldn't pick it up because I don't speak French." But then Nufi was uh, inserted into that uh, discussion. Uh, and I was like, what did you call me? <laughs> and he just sort of looked at me and, and knew that I sort of picked up that, that he had said something uh, offensive, at least to me anyway. So for those who don't really know the history of the word Nufi, what caused the word to be considered derogatory in the first place? It goes way back, right? Yeah, it's, it's uh, the origins from what I could find and uh, referencing uh, the work of uh, the late Peter Navi as a folklorist at Memorial was that uh, it originated from uh, uh, a discussion of a, an American radio narrative that was being discussed on uh, Smallwood's, uh, uh, former Premier Joseph Smallwood's, uh, the Barrelman program. However, there's anecdotal reports of it being employed by Americans who were upset at uh, uh, Newfoundlanders having quit uh, the, uh, the, uh, the construction site when a gentia was being built uh, during the Second World War. So is there like a, a generational gap when it comes to who finds the word offensive? Like do younger Newfoundlanders tend to be more okay with the word? I think that's a bit of a mixed bag mm -hmm. um, in a sense that I think you could find some uh, individuals who are of, of the older generation who have no problem with the term uh, and see it as a mark of pride. Uh, certainly in the research that I did with uh, the youth they talked about, they felt that perhaps and those youth who did comment on it uh, did felt that their parents or grandparents probably would find it more offensive than they would. But, you know, in, you know, the, the experience that I found in, in speaking to these uh, 30 youth was basically, you know, it ran from, you know, well, I don't find it offensive to I find it very offensive to, well, it depends on the context in which it's used. So there's the context, but what about who is using the word? Yes, and that certainly played into the issue of context. Um, you know, those who talked about, you know, the, the contextual nature of the word said, well, if it's another Newfoundlander using the term, or it's my friends who are Newfoundlanders, then, you know, I really have no problem with it. But if it's someone from, uh, say, Ontario, and they're using it uh, in a, you know, in derogatory way, or they feel that it's being used in a derogatory way, uh, then they, they had to take issue with it. Your recommendation to people would be just not to use it. Yeah, I think um, my belief is is that you know it it ought not to be used in in general conversation. Uh, but again, who will vehemently agree with me and those who will vehemently disagree with me, uh, and I think the uh, the decision is still out on uh, you know for the majority of Newfoundlanders on whether they feel uh, that it's uh, that it's derogatory or not. And even just watching. Um, or rather reading the comments on the, the CBC website, you know, ranged from, yes, it's derogatory, to no, it's not. <laughs> so, you know, there's definitely a, uh, 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 a mixed bag out there in terms of how people respond to that term and how they feel about it. Yeah, it's certainly a topic that gets people going, <laughs> for sure. James yeah, Baker, no, uh, thank you so much for speaking with us. Really appreciate it. Thank you, and have a good day. You too. The weather update is brought to you by Belltone Hearing Service St. John's, helping the world hear better. 
always an interesting topic uh, to chat about. And yeah. I just should say that uh, you heard, heard uh, Baker mention that he did some interviews as part of the research. Well, he actually spoke with 30 MUN students about this. So it was a pretty narrow cross section of people. And he admits that, you know, that was pretty narrow and he'd like to see a bigger study done. And he's also going to be presenting his findings uh, tomorrow at McMaster University at a conference. Cool. Yeah. Uh, okay. So long weekend. We know pretty much anything's possible mm -hmm. uh, in terms of weather. And uh, yeah, this will be one of those weekends, I think, where we're going to remember it for the wrong reasons. Aww. At least it's shaping up that way. Have a look at uh, highs across Atlantic Canada today. We did have a pretty nice one temperature-wise. St. John's to Gander. You can see where the cooler air, uh, thanks to the onshore winds over northern parts of the Maritimes, yet uh, 18 in Greenwood, 22 in Fredericton, 10 in Happy Valley Goose Bay. So more melting there with that Churchill River rising and, of course, uh, keeping a very close eye on things in Happy Valley Goose Bay. The 5 to 10 millimeters on the way tonight is not going to be helping things at all. That rain will continue over the par parts of the west coast as well. 5 to 10 millimeters there and then it will roll up into Wednesday morning. Picking things up Wednesday morning, you can see where we are looking at the wet flurries mixing in over Happy Valley Goose Bay up towards the north coast of Labrador with flurries there across the island. Persistent showers along the west coast tomorrow, scattered risk into central and eastern areas, especially into the afternoon, but not ruling out a sunbreak either. And note with the southwest winds, temperatures are going to be cooler in those onshore winds, but I do think we have double digit potential tomorrow from St. John's up towards Clarenville and Terra Nova. And again, cooler in those onshore west northwest winds for the west coast six seven degrees there there are those wet flurries mixing in in the southeast and a better chance of just straight old flurries for Nain up through McCovic with some light accumulation even possible eight to ten degrees in the west now rolling forward this low will be moving to the north a bit of a break in between these two systems and so Thursday is actually shaping up to be a pretty nice one especially across the island we're looking at sun and cloud on the menu temperatures ranging from 12 I think we'll even see some 14 15 degree temps for the inland parts of the Avalon 16 17 degrees possible central western and Labrador not half bad either looking at some scattered showers in the west and sun and cloud in the east now into the Friday time period this system will roll to the north a new low develops along the cold front this will track in through the day on Friday best chance of showers is into the west I do think some scattered showers move into central and eastern Newfoundland into the Friday afternoon time period especially again 12 to 16 degrees generally across the island Flurries mixing in for western parts of Labrador on the northern edge of this system. And again, starting this by saying still a lot of uncertainty with this setup. Uh, forecast models are still trying to figure out exactly what the setup will be, but it does appear the low will move to the north coast of the island. Cold air wraps in on the backside, and so we have snow potential anywhere from Happy Valley Goose Bay and southeastern Labrador to the northern peninsula, and then yes, even central Newfoundland. Not out of the question to see some accumulating snow for later Sunday and in through the Monday time period before an area of high pressure comes in. So, yeah, it's uh, not pretty. And if you could see Debbie Cooper's face, it's just sheer disappointment. And I, I do feel somewhat uh, bad. I do feel bad that I wish I could uh, have some different uh, forecast details here. But it is what it is, and we're still a few days out. And hey, things could change, and uh, we'll keep you posted. Obviously, as I mentioned, still some disagreement. And uh, yeah, over the coming days, we'll nail that down in more detail. There's the forecast in Labrador. Again, snow looking set for the southeast Saturday into Sunday. I'm so glad I didn't put away the winter boots oh. and the coat yet. <laughs> That's right. You never say never here. Never, never. Okay, we're going to feature a dynamic duo in our young athlete segment. Peyton and Raina Hines are sisters from Paradise. Peyton is eight years old and Raina is six. Both girls participate in the Can Skate program. They also enjoy swimming and ballet. Pretty sure they're weather fans as well. Congratulations, Peyton and Raina. We salute you as today's Young Athletes of the Day. It may be untouched, but this uninhabited island in the Pacific is no South Seas paradise, as you can see. 
Researchers say it's one of the most polluted places on Earth. Wow, just look at that. It's covered in trash from as far away as Canada. They estimate that there are 38 million pieces of plastic on the island, with another 13,000 new pieces washing ashore every day. Oh, dear. wow. That's tragic. It is. Welcome back to Here and Now. About 60 high school students around St. John's got a taste of what life is like as a police officer today. They were job shadowing at the Royal Newfoundland Constabulary. The students learned some of the different aspects of the job from defensive tactics and fingerprinting to the shooting range. This is called a Mossberg. It's a less lethal shotgun, but what it shoots is a beanbag round. Pick a brush and a powder and try and find fingerprints. This is the program that we've set up uh, for job shadowing for students in all the high schools in the, in the Northeast Avalon. What this does is able to have the kids come here and uh, find out what it's like being a police officer. So we have different things. We have we're come to an identification section like they're doing behind us here now. We have in the gym where so they do defensive tactics moves where their cadets are showing them that information. We're on the range to show the people about our firearms and different types of use of force equipment that we use. Kids love this. Um, a lot of people from their careers class or they're from uh, grade 10, 11, and 12 uh, that might want to be a police officer later on. We have recruitment unit earlier talking to them about being a police officer. We've had the chief come in to address them, and it gives them an idea, a sense of what it's like to be a police officer for, for the day here. I learned um, how much uh, hard work and dedication it takes to become a police officer. Someday uh, I'd like to be wearing a uniform, you know, helping out. Well, a man who spent his early years in this province and is considered a rising star in Ontario politics has joined the race to become leader of the federal NDP. I am proud to announce that I am running to be the leader of the new Democratic Party of Canada. 
Yes, Jagmeet Singh made it official last night in English and French before a packed banquet hall in Brampton, just west of Toronto. He represents the same area for the New Democrats in the Ontario Legislature. Now, Singh lived in St. John's and Grand Falls, Windsor during the first few years of his life. His announcement brings to seven the number of candidates in the race to succeed Tom Mulcair. Animal rights activists call it a major victory in the fight to protect whales and dolphins, but others say banning the animals at the Vancouver Aquarium goes too far. The city's parks board made the decision last night. As Greg Rasmussen reports, the aquarium says sick and injured animals may now have to be euthanized instead of rescued. Also known to be very acrobatic. Once home to orcas and belugas, the large tanks at the Vancouver Aquarium now house the injured and abandoned, such as these dolphins unable to survive in the wild. All in favour. Cheered on by animal rights activists, new rules were brought in by Vancouver's Parks Board last night. No new whales, dolphins or other cetaceans can ever be brought into the aquarium under any circumstances. We stood up and we stood for something. And at the end of the day, this is not a political decision. This is the right decision. Thank you. The aquarium warns under the new rules, animals like this one would never have been rescued. That is not an animal welfare uh, decision. Um, that's the opposite. It's an uncaring decision. Chester, an infant false killer whale, was rescued on the beach, near death. One, two, three. Rehabilitated and is now thriving in the aquarium's pools. As you can see, he is very healthy. The aquarium says its large tanks and medical facilities is the only place to provide long-term care to whales and dolphins. They say they're acting in the best interest of the cetaceans by doing this. They are absolutely wrong. There's no question. This is a ridiculous, if that's the justification, this is a ridiculous way to do that. Science first! Fearing the end of future animal rescues, hundreds of aquarium supporters showed up to protest last night and heard a vow from the aquarium to keep fighting. So all I can say is that if we let it stop here, we give up on the animals that need help the most. Nightingale says there's no telling when the next animal needing human help will be found. At that point, he says, it will likely come down to a choice, either violate the new bylaw or euthanize the animal on the beach. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Vancouver. It is wholly appropriate for the president to share whatever information he thinks is necessary to advance the security of the American people. The U.S. president is under heavy criticism again. Donald Trump is reported to have given classified information last week to the Russian foreign minister. Rebuttals are flying. A congressional staff member says the House Intelligence Committee will get a briefing on the issue from the director of the CIA. Both Republicans and Democrats are expressing concern.
Well, if you don't live in Avon, Connecticut, this next site is probably a first for you. Oh, oh, oh. Bouncing baby bears. This uh, furry family is taking in a little trampoline time together. Ah, don't you love the music? <laughs> <laughs> the town has become a bear central for the state with over 550 sightings in the past year. Yes, you can say these cubs sure know how to enjoy the bear necessities of life. Nice, Stokesy. <laughs> <laughs> They are adorable. <laughs> Wouldn't you just love to get in there with them? And no. Just <laughs> bounce with all baby bears? You've family? never been up close and personal <laughs> with a bear, have you, Carol? Sure, they're I think harmless. they might bite. Yeah. <laughs> they might be a bit aggressive with the wrestling. Mama is lurking in the yeah, Exactly, in the wings. that too. <laughs> Uh, quick check on your forecast. Again, cool in those onshore winds for the west and south coast. Tomorrow, warmer along the northeast coast where we could see a sunbreak. That wet snow in Labrador. And who wants to go for a swim? Oh, wow. Beautiful. Is that not great? That is a picture taken near Catalina by Krista Diamond. And it literally looks like a swimming pool in the ocean. <laughs> great Tad <shot>. cool, I think. <laughs> yeah. Good for a polar bear swim. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> we should say happy birthday to Rod Dobbin yes. before we leave. It's Rod our Dobbin, fearless director. The guy who's in our pulling ear. Pulling all the levers. His birthday all the time. today. Happy Have birthday. a great night, everybody. <laughs> Good night. <laughs>